Welcome to Startup TV Boston. My name is Michael McCarthy, and I'd like to welcome my guest today, Laurie Stack. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> welcome, Laurie. I started Startup TV Boston for our students at Harvard University who were taking the Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and the entire program was designed to make them create a startup. At the end of the semester, they didn't know where to go. They wanted to continue to have support, and I wanted to help them raise money, and I decided to create Startup TV Boston so that they could take their pitch on TV, throw that on YouTube, and then send that around to venture capitalists around the world to try to raise money. I've expanded, and I met Laurie at MIT launch last summer, and I want to introduce you to Laurie and her Startup for Startups. So Laurie, tell <laughs> us what you do. Uh, yeah, so I founded and run the, well, formerly known as MIT Launch Program, now Launch X Program, and it's an entrepreneurship program for high school students, though we, we do think of ourselves a little bit more in the education space than specifically just entrepreneurship. Uh, the reason I started the company is I know when I was in high school, I had so much creativity, drive, passion, wanted to take on the world, mm -hmm. uh, and adults would always say, oh, you'll do great things someday. We need to get a degree, some experience, you know, someday. Uh, but meanwhile, we're actually not preparing these students for someday. They don't, they're, they're coming out with a knowledge base, but not the real skills and mindset. Mm -hmm. So I love how much entrepreneurship allows these students to kind of prototype their career, play with different industries and functions, build the real skills for their futures. So how long has LaunchX been around? When did you start this? Uh, it was an idea in summer of 2012. Uh, so just over five years now. So we've had, we have five summer programs over our, under our belt now and are, are growing into new areas. Is this a nonprofit, volunteer, for-profit? Is What kind of business is this? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so through a couple of restructurings of things. So the first couple of years of the program, it was an entirely separate company that I ran and uh, the summer program was run at MIT. And then we went fully in-house at MIT. So since MIT is a nonprofit, we were our own kind of nonprofit within a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, but now spinning back out, we've restructured it to a benefit corporation, which is kind of weirdly between a for-profit and nonprofit. It's still for in the articles of incorporation. Uh, you can require that certain aspects of the mission go above profit. So versus regular for-profit companies have to put the shareholder and profitability first. Mm -hmm. uh, due to fiduciary duties, et cetera, uh, we actually can put aspects of our mission first above profit, but still be a for-profit company. So it's a bit of a hybrid between a for-profit and a non-profit yeah. entrepreneurship to me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how did you start? How did you, how did the first, <clears throat> the first event happen? How did you do it? Yeah, um, so like I said, it was an idea in July, August of 2012, and then uh, our, our main program, the one that we started with that's still our flagship, is uh, the LaunchX Summer Program. Mm -hmm. So that's where students come from all over the U.S. and world, live on a university campus, and start real companies in four weeks. So that's the, the one that you helped out as a mentor or mock board member of this yes, past summer. that's where we met. Yeah. Um, so that came about, yeah, it was just an idea. Um, just under a year is a pretty short timeline to throw something like that together. Uh, but it was, you know, just a series of setting up the different milestones and figuring out how to prioritize, you know, partnerships and application, admissions, uh, curriculum development, everything to pull together that first summer. So let's walk through some of the specifics. How did you find these students from around the world who wanted to apply to the program? That is, that is a great question. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, marketing, I think, is one of the biggest challenges of any company. So, you know, extrapolating to your vision of this being, <laughs> you know, for, for folks interested in startups. Um, the other dime a dozen, it comes down to implementation and execution, and in particular, finding those customers and, and getting them bought in. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for this, I remember in the first year, we, um, we always set up two application deadlines, the early and the, and the regular, mm -hmm. uh, per what a lot of schools do. And the early application deadline, just to be a little bit like vulnerable and openly honest about it, we only had five applications at the early, okay. <laughs> early application deadline that year. And um, so, so knew that we had to put a lot more force behind it. And so that ended up being just tons of throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what stuck. Went to a summer programs fair for high school students, social media, looked up a list of the top 500 high schools in the US and went to the website of each of those and found email addresses of the counselors and emailed them. Um, 
gutless. You really beat the bushes. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But it worked, and uh, we had we had space for 30 students in that first summer, and ended up getting around 215 applicants. So just Good. yeah, so just under a 15% admit rate even in our first year. Um, so success from the from the outset. <laughs> so if you if we looked at the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of our students are coming from 20% of our marketing efforts. What were the marketing efforts that really worked? Uh, getting listed on the MIT website. Uh, sure. <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> yep. You know, well, because they have a portion of their website that's particularly for, like, pre-college students and mm -hmm. says, you know, preparing to apply to MIT. Here are some suggestions. And one of them lists all of their summer programs. So when you get these applications, how did you know, what was your criteria for choosing a high schooler to say, yeah, you might have a potential to be an entrepreneur? What were you looking for? Oh my gosh, our application is like one of my favorite parts of the program. Uh, other folks that I know in universities are a little bit jealous of how much fun we have. Okay. Uh, so in addition to having some of the things like grades and activities listing, we have them submit. In the first years, it was a PowerPoint slide deck, but now a video of up to 60 seconds just introducing yourself to your future class at launch. So telling who you are, what you care about, why entrepreneurship. And so that plus seeing some of the different activities they've done is, is really telling of their entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and really what we students who have shown some initiative in something outside of just the normal channels. Uh, so having Any examples. Uh, so students who have started a mini nonprofit, played around with like 3D printing, published an app, um, or just have like random hobbies on the side that they pursue with passion. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it doesn't need to be that students necessarily know themselves well enough to say, you know, I'm gonna be a programmer and within it. We just wanna see that they've taken some initiative and executed on it and been resilient through some of the troubleshooting of some kind of cool, weird, quirky thing outside of just the regular like check the box clubs at school. Okay, so some kind of uniqueness. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about that first year, some of these students, what what was your experience? Were you surprised, not surprised when they actually showed up? It's like, oh look, there's a human behind that application. What were your what were your thoughts? Oh my God, the first summer was amazing. Uh, I even in the first year of launch still had my my other job, management consulting, that I started this on the side. And I, I knew going into that first day even that there was no way I was going back to consulting, that, that I was full time in this now. And I remember talking to some career counselors even then that fall just to, you know, get affirmation that, that was definitely what I wanted to do. And they were, they were so impressed with, uh, with what we had done over the summer. They asked me some things like I remember asking me my favorite year and they were all from that summer. Like the first wow. day that students showed up and seeing it all come together, seeing them pitch their ideas from, from pre-work. Um, the last day, just being so proud of what they had pulled together in four weeks. Like they started companies in four weeks. And it, just it was looking, amazing what they came up with in and that short. Looking everybody on like the edge of their seats and just, ah, it's, it's amazing to see um, just the growth and transformation and then see parents come on that last day and say things like, oh my God, my kid grew up in a month, or um, kids saying, you know, I have the confidence to take on anything now, um, I have a better idea of what I want to do with my life, going back and changing up classes, know where I want to apply to school, everything. Uh, it's really amazing to see the transformation. So tell me about some of the growth you've had from that of where you are now. Um, yeah, so within launch, um, there has been an insane amount of growth. I think I was mentioning before this that I blew through some uh, forecasts of what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, so since then, we've grown the summer program to, uh, you know, it's 30 students, like I said, in that first summer, that we run two sessions of 80 students each. And then one of the other new parts of it is we've developed high school clubs. So even in that first year, students would go back to their high schools and want to share their love of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. uh, so they and teach their peers. And we were like, that's really cool. Let's put some organization around that. Yeah. Uh, so from that, the, the Launch Club was born. We started with just like little tests of, you know, providing some materials to alumni. And last year we were in 120 high schools. And this year uh, we're in just over 500 high schools, which we actually capped it this year. We had almost double that many applicants uh, of schools. Wow. And really the goal there is in five years, I want to be in 20,000 high schools. 
So tell me a little bit more. What what is this club and how does it work? What are, what what are some of the details? Uh, so we provide the MELS resources support for students to start companies throughout the school year through an after school club. So. Uh, a student at a high school can, can start a club if they want. They apply through our, um, through our website and build a leadership team. So there's, uh, within these schools, it is student run. We ask them to have a faculty advisor, but mm -hmm. uh, part of the, the value of it is just showing how much student demand there is for this to then become more ingrained within the high schools and get you know, the educators on board with entrepreneurship education. So the students are running these clubs. Are mm -hmm. these weekly gatherings, monthly? How often do they typically meet? Uh, weekly. So we have uh, like 20 modules of materials mm -hmm. that we provide them, the lesson plan, a video, uh, PowerPoint deck, and some activities, and then also have a whole online tracking system, uh, like a put their progress, and mentors provide feedback on there, as well as then a monthly call with those, those mentors. And is there a final product at the end of those 20 weeks? Uh, so it's, it's their company, and yes, so at the end of it they do submit a pitch to us, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not a pitch competition. Um, we, we do invite some of the teams who have made a lot of really good progress to MIT in the spring for a you know, celebration, mm -hmm. uh, but it is just that. It's a, it's a celebration and rewarding them actually doing the work behind the company. So what we really want to see is that they've made real traction, like that they've gotten out there, interviewed customers, understand really deeply that there's a, an intense need to be solved, and started testing whether or not they can solve that. Uh, and then, I mean, a lot of them actually do end up generating some revenue, getting some partnerships, and that's what we want to see. That's what we reward. It's, it's not a business pitch competition of like a, who can do the better job of Googling, you know, something. Right, <laughs> But very much like building a company. And how do you maintain the quality of the education when it's student run and you're not there on site? How do you make sure that they're really getting good quality? Yeah, that's definitely one of the challenges that we've been troubleshooting some over the over the course of the last few years. Uh, so the education leads at each of those schools attend a monthly webinar where we provide them the kind of how to implement materials. But then for each week, there's a, a lesson plan that they go to that, that lays out, you know, first 10 minutes discussion on this, next five minutes, run this video, next 30 minutes, walk through these slides. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've we've laid it out fairly simply, and then even in the coming, um, this will be available at, starting November, we have a, a will kind of like walk them through that entire process mm -hmm. um, that you know allows, allows it to be simple, easy to implement throughout the year. And where do you get the content for the workbook so that you know that they're getting the best information? Where do you source that? Um, so it's, it's based on the materials that we've done for the launch summer program and where that was pieced together, uh, a lot of it is from my time at MIT uh, that I coordinated with some of the folks there to ensure that we had some of the practices of discipline entrepreneurship, but then also integrated some lean startup design thinking. Um, but really a lot of it is even just from the, the first year of putting this together and you know, looking at different things that were out there, talking to tons of my previous professors from MIT and Harvard, and just seeing what kind of things needed to fit together and in what order to be able to, to have success. Great, so now you have these high school clubs, and you've had the summer program, and you, you basically outgrew MIT. What happened with that? We did. <laughs> what are you gonna be growing into next? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I feel like it's kind of even a weird thing to say that, yeah, we out, outgrew MIT. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so as I said, our, our flagship program has been the summer program, and then we now have the clubs, which I think is one of the biggest growth potentials of this going forward. And so just as an example, this last year for the summer program, we had 1,300 applicants for the 80 students in each of two sessions. Um, wow. So yeah, getting far more competitive than we, we wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a huge opportunity there that we're going to be growing to additional universities next summer. So we'll be announcing those in the next month or so here. Uh, but we'll be in a couple of additional universities next summer, and then we'll be growing out the summer program some more from there. Uh, as well as then for the clubs, like I said, we want to be in 20,000 high schools in five wow. years and are really seeing the club's platform as a means of kind of proving the student demand. Us to be able to have teachers go through a teacher training program that we're developing so then we can hopefully in the next you know, 20 years have entrepreneurship education in every high school in the world. Oh, 
Oh, I would love that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I wish I had that. That was been so much better than home economics with Mrs. Gowdy. That was <laughs> so in class. Yeah, I would much rather had entrepreneurship. Excellent. So you have the you have the summer clubs, which are basically because you're you were turning away too many qualified people, mm -hmm. and you just want to have more places to fit these people. Yep, okay. exactly. <laughs> Are you thinking of possibly doing this in other countries? Other kids, well, they were from all over the world, but. Are you thinking of doing some summer hosting at universities outside the U.S.? Yeah, that's absolutely part of the like five-year plan. Uh, so this coming summer, we're, and probably for a couple of years, we'll stick to the U.S. so that we can replicate it with a few, a few fewer variables than going internationally, see what works well, what doesn't, so then we have a bit better idea of, of how to ensure that that's a quality scaling internationally, because there's additional contextual challenges anytime you go international. Gotcha. Uh, so that's, that's one piece of it that we plan on growing. And then ultimately where I see us going five, ten years as well is high school to more K-12. Uh, so I think, really? Yeah, I think as you get more in the K-8, instead of it just being entrepreneurship, it, it becomes a bit more entrepreneurship and innovation. But I think there's a huge opportunity there that, gosh, we've had so much demand already. And I mean, we've had to be like turning down people who have come to us from other countries saying like, hey, yeah, we have... We have a university ready to, to implement this in you know, these different countries. And um, oh gosh, have you considered doing it for middle school? Have you considered doing it for this? Uh, there's too many exciting opportunities right now where we're focused on trying to ensure quality growth first. <laughs> well, I could see on the K to 12, what pops in my head is really fostering the creativity and innovation side, like maybe popping up the entrepreneurship money-making end of it, but just keeping that in it because it's, it's already there, it's already doing it. Exactly, keeping that kind of spirit alive. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And then I, I think it is a little bit more towards high school and, well, maybe even later middle school that you want to start pushing them to think about commercialization and how to like extract value from that problem solving. Yeah, like but I think, cool idea and how could that be useful and, okay, now make sure it's useful and, okay, I need to make money at it. <laughs> so, yeah, I could see the progression of that. It would be cool to keep the creativity going because as grown-ups, it that pops out pretty fast. Yeah, I occasionally even, uh, when, I, when I emphasize to these high school students why they're at the perfect age to, to be starting a company, to be innovating, um, I, I tell them that essentially, like if you get too much experience, you have what I call the I should have known better effect. So you're afraid to innovate because if you do anything besides the status quo way, then people within the field will kind of like look down on you and say, oh, well, you should have known better than to, to try doing something differently. There's a standard, a method. Uh, so, mm. I mean, these high school students, they've been raised with the latest technology, they um, have such an aptitude for learning, and yet they don't have so much experience that it holds them back from being able to really innovate. Interesting. So you also mentioned something about online education. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so in the last few years, we also developed an online course in partnership with MIT. So that's on the MIT form. And we actually, just in the last um, month here, released a new version of it that is hilarious and fun. There's a guy in a cookie costume and another in a toilet costume. And yeah, check it out. It's, it's loads of fun. I think I'd like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that one's designed, um, at least as we sat back and said, what are the types of students that are interested in entrepreneurship education um, because they, they want that type of outlet within the education space. We saw there's two main camps of it. There's what we call the more like experienced, ready to go entrepreneur, the ones that are coming to the summer program that have already started developing their little mini nonprofit and 3D printers and apps and everything. Um, I call the like exploratory and curious entrepreneur, the ones who have heard about you know Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and uh, want to find out what this crazy new sexy thing is all about, <laughs> but aren't yeah. sure where to start. And for those in particular, uh, the online course is a great first resource. That's kind of a, a quick risk-free way to dip your toe in the water. And then the clubs is where we bring together both of those students. So we leverage the more experience ready to go to start the club and mm -hmm. then to teach their peers that, that want that network and forum to be able to explore. And what would a student be getting benefit-wise from going, from just staying at the club versus going to a summer program? Is there any in that jump? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say, um, I mean, I'd gotten this question before from, from students and parents, and the best analogy I've come up with is it's kind of the difference between 
um, reading a book from a professor and going and sitting in that professor's class. Uh, so getting that community of other people that are also just raring to go, like really excited about, the, about entrepreneurship, but then also getting that firsthand instruction from, uh, from the instructors that we bring into the classroom, being able to have that exciting engagement, uh, plus having great mock board members that you sit in with each week yeah. <laughs> to be able to really ingrain the learning further. <laughs> what was interesting about the students when I was on those mock boards is how mm. like yeah. the, the app the apps that they were doing. Oh, we, we did this app mock up, and I said, "How did you do that?" And they're like, "Oh, it's just it's just a website. What's that website?" So they were they were teaching me things, <laughs> it, but it really fascinated me that they were these teenagers that just had this coding thing. Like, oh yeah, no big deal. We'll just throw up a website and code it. Oh yeah, it's it's something that there's a, a few of us that are the core. LaunchX staff members uh, that are all absolutely phenomenal and but then every summer we bring on a team of interns that are all alumni like previous students of the program and oh my god they're amazing they're where I find out about all the cool new tech things of like yeah. you know yeah slack and vision um, all kinds of different it was in vision right I, I yep. picked okay. up, yeah. <laughs> And I also found that the, the interns who had been students the year before, they asked the harshest questions. Some of them were brutal. I was like, my God, be gentle with their children. You know? They're like, nah. I think I know who you were in a room with. <laughs> I mean, good question, but I was like, whoa. Yeah, and I mean, that's also part of the cool thing of it when we have them pitch in class, too. They will be harsh with each other with questions in class, but that's part of the community. They, yeah. they all know that it's, it's part of helping each other. It's not that they're trying to put each other down because, Correct. again, we, particularly in the summer program, we have a final pitch event, but it's not about judging or ranking. Mm -hmm. It's very much a let's pitch, um, have a, a room of great people that can provide additional feedback, resources, support to be able to continue. It's more about what, do we, where do we go from here? Like this is a snapshot. We're going to leave soon. How do we make sure we're set up for success? Right. And so, in knowing that that's the objective, and that it's not to you know try to put something on your resume of being first place, they they're very much more motivated towards towards really helping each other. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes it comes in the in the form of harsh feedback, or also do events where we have students share different cool things that they might be able to use to support each other. But it's a, it's a pretty amazing community. <laughs> and that's, that's been really cool to see is, I mean, every launchy that I talked to past the summer says that they still talk to other people from the program every day. Good to hear. Good to hear. Now, how do you make money? I mean, you're doing wonderful things for other people. <laughs> what are you doing for yourself? Um, for, for myself? So as far as <laughs> <laughs> work is life. Uh, <laughs> I understand that. So we, we do charge for the summer program. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we charge, it's, uh, I think, around $6,000 per student. And that, for us, covers housing and curriculum and staff and a number of our other costs. Um, but then also allows us to be able to offer financial need-based scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, so over a quarter of our students this past summer were on some form of financial needs scholarship, and like the average amount of those was three quarters of the program fees. So oh, we wow. ma we make it accessible regardless of financials since the beginning. Um, but yeah, then the the summer program fees have allowed us to experiment and build the other things that I mentioned, which is also why the benefit corp structure is is very important because when starting the clubs or the online course or anything, um, they were investments had no idea where, where or if we would ever get money from those. It just made sense for me within the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've always made sure to have a little bit of flexibility to be able to do that. And it's nice that there's a legal entity structure that can, can mimic that mindset. <laughs> so is there any profit you get from the clubs? Or is it break even? Or is it you're donating to all those materials that they get and resources? How's the finance side of the clubs? This is still an investment uh it's it's not even quite to break even and i'm actually debating uh that's how the question of for nonprofit. uh probably in the next year we're going to have that be a separate nonprofit entity uh because we started to provide additional resources to students who are continu continuing their company from the previous year mm -hmm. so instead of going back through the kind of year one materials then in the second year we provide more advanced mentors and then they can also apply for small grants from us so particularly to be able to get folks to, to help with funding those grants. 
well, assuming the experiment goes well this year. Yeah, it'll well, be. One of my thoughts is you wouldn't even need to charge much if you did have twenty thousand high schools, and you netted a dollar per school per year. It's twenty thousand net, greater than zero. But I'm wondering, have you thought about is this going to be one club for the high school, or do you envision a freshman club, a soft club, a senior club, so they can move up in the curriculum to, to more sophisticated techniques? So it'll be one club at the school because we still want to leverage those folks that are continuing to, to help out the folks that it's their first year of the club. And I guess their, their actual like raw grade doesn't matter as much as whether they've been through the mat material. So it could have been that you know a club is started and it's students across all four years. And it's actually kind of nice to have that bit of mixing of folks across years. That is true. Um, but then in their second year of their club, then they might want to be continued the previous year. But there, we've laid out in the curriculum that there's at least once a month that the entire club is together and does some sharing. And then um, there's other times in that they, the, we ca we're calling them like our year two varsity team members. Uh, so that the, nice. <laughs> the varsity club members have some of their own materials that are uh, provided more directly from myself and the team versus just through their club members. Gotcha. So if for our final minute on the show, what's, what's one final parting thought that you want to make sure people hear while we're together? What do people need to hear? I, I think they need to hear that there is a huge value to entrepreneurship education, that as we've done the research and analytics on it, uh, we've, we've actually even shown that entrepreneurship education teaches students the skills and mindset for success in the future. Like it, it has been the single biggest thing that's contributed towards the development of these components from our alumni. And then as we've, we've done additional studies, it's just been really powerful to see. Uh, so if, if anything, I would say um, everybody knows the education system needs to change. Entrepreneurship is the thing that can do it, that can prepare students to be successful, to have more confidence in their futures, and also reinvigorate our economy. <laughs> It's true. We need that. We need some of that. Laurie, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And everyone, thank you for being part of our show, and we'll see you next time. Take care.